In part one of this special report mini-series, we took a look at some of the staggering statistics surrounding UFOs and alien encounters and took a brief gander at details of some of the military UFO encounters. The capabilities of these UFOs were stunning, pushing the envelope of the supernatural. So were they actually supernatural events or were they simply demonstrating that we are still ignorant in physics? And how could we discern between the two? We already heard the testimony of one Pentagon official who believed these UFO encounters were in fact supernatural. He believed they were demonic. Now he certainly would have had his reasons for coming to that conclusion. So how could we discern if he's correct or not? We'll tackle these and other questions in part two of this mini-series, a Genesis Week special report. Thanks for joining me again. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Thank you as well to the enormous amount of feedback on part one. Production of this mini-series was not even on my radar two weeks ago, and I've been burning the midnight oil at both ends trying to produce this mini-series. As such, mistakes happen. When making the graphics for the program, I made some 3D graphics to sort of help people envision the scene. And when I made the models, I was having all kinds of technical issues with the modeling. I spent many hours fighting with hair pulling frustrations that should not have been. In the meantime, in trying to make the shape of the UFO, I had a chiclet in mind, not a Tic Tac. So several viewers asked about why my Tic Tac UFO wasn't Tic Tac shaped. Well, that's the reason. <laughs> I'll come back to this when we're talking about Mensa and Genius Intelligence. So, many people have been asking me whether UFOs are just man-made, high-tech, or demonic in nature. I've honestly been dodging the, the answer because the answer is yes. <laughs> it's a very complicated answer. You pretty much have to take each individual instance and examine it to you know, discern which it is. Shortly, I'll set out to disappoint everybody by demonstrating how we know it's not aliens from somewhere else in the universe. I'd like to start off part two of this mini-series by quoting the famous writer Arthur C. Clarke, who once said, Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so we have a challenge before us to discern whether UFOs are sufficiently advanced technology from other people on Earth that dazzles us by being indistinguishable from magic, or interdimensional craft, or beings like spiritual entities, or aliens and their own advanced technology. I'd like to start by taking a brief tour throughout history of man's technology, and by quoting another very famous writer, the wisest person ever to live on planet Earth. There is no new thing under the sun. In 1921, a 16-year-old boy was experimenting in his home lab in Ohio with a device called a Coolidge tube. Now, the Coolidge tube was a vacuum tube that produced x-rays, but it had two electrodes that were different sizes. They were asymmetrical. The two asymmetrical plates make up an electronic component known as a condenser or capacitor, which is a very simple part composed of two metal plates separated by an insulator. That young boy was Thomas Townsend Brown, and what he discovered was that when charged with a high voltage, the Coolidge tube actually produced a force in the direction of the smaller electrode. An asymmetrical capacitor charged to a high voltage, produces a force in the direction of the smaller electrode. Now, this was 1921, literally 100 years ago, 100 years ago. In the century that has followed, Brown and countless others, including people like Nikola Tesla and even yours truly in my own humble lab, have reproduced Brown's results either accidentally or deliberately. Now, I won't waste your time with details because otherwise we'll chase rabbit trails till the cows fly. But let's just say that my own personal research into this effect 
has been a continual stream of surprises and unexpected results. There is definitely a force being generated there, and it works even in a vacuum. So this is now known as the Byfield-Brown effect, after Brown gave credit to his university professor who guided him in the discovery process, Dr. Paul Byfield. Over the next several decades, Brown would improve and perfect this force with experiments and demonstrations around the world. Uh, these photographs were taken at a lab in France where Jacques Corneau invited Brown to conduct more research. They even conducted experiments in high vacuum. Just before he passed away in 2008, Mr. Corneau made his photographs and documentation public. And last I checked, the Project Montgolfier website was down. So far as I know, that website was the only place he formerly published his previously undisclosed documentation. Notice the French spelling of projet in the domain name. Right after his research in France, Brown gave demonstrations before U.S. military brass so significant that the results of his demonstration were promptly classified. Brown specifically made several types of flying disc, which were usually tethered. Though any shape would work, disc shapes apparently worked best. Now, we don't know how fast his demonstration discs flew because it was classified. But a Swiss aeronautics magazine, Interavia, mentioned in passing the discs were capable of speeds of several hundred miles per hour. Let us also bear in mind, Brown was giving these demonstrations to the military brass indoors, in a gymnasium. <laughs> so undoubtedly, having three-foot diameter metal discs spinning around you at hundreds of miles an hour would have been a demonstration that left an impression. And this was in 1954, 67 years ago. In fact, as the incredibly tenacious researcher Dr. Paul Laviolette points out in several chapters of his book, Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion, all of the major aerospace players of the world were actively researching this new anti-gravity technology that nobody understood and they were all openly talking about it and how anti-gravity would revolutionize the aerospace industry. All the big U.S. companies, Glenn L. Martin, Lockheed, Grumman, Hughes, Bell, General Electric, Douglas, Lear, Convair, they all had research and development programs exploring this new electrogravitics phenomenon. Even the Russian news agency, TASS, claimed that Russian scientists were researching this effect in hopes of canceling or modifying gravity. And then in 1959, they all stopped talking about it at the same time. All discussion was shut down virtually overnight, presumably as all research suddenly went black and was put under the cover of top secret. It was also at the time that a curious and perplexing event happened here in the aerospace industry on what was without a doubt the leading aerospace project on planet Earth at that time, right here in Canada. The Byfield-Brown effect is now considered a truism. Even NASA has understandably taken an interest in this effect. I mean, think about it. If you can generate a force that works in a vacuum by simply charging an asymmetrical capacitor to high voltage, well, that just sounds like a super simple, reliable, awesome propulsion device for spacecraft. So you can quickly see, start to see why NASA obtained patent 6317310 entitled Apparatus and method for generating thrust using a two-dimensional asymmetrical capacitor module. In 2010, an international patent was filed claiming to not only use this effect, but that the effect was transmedium. That is, it would work in air, on land, underwater, and space. You remember the dramatic footage provided by Jeremy Corbell that we showed last week? of these spherical drones which apparently flew through the air, then entered the water and continued traveling underwater. What Lou Elizondo called transmedium because this craft was able to work in different mediums like air or water. But Brown also coincidentally discovered that these high voltage charges would not only produce this mystery force, it had unexpected benefits. 
For example, if you have electrodes on an object moving through the air and you apply a high voltage charge to the surface of the object, it charges the air which causes all kinds of aerodynamic effects, as dramatically demonstrated here in Alexei Kozlov's doctoral dissertation. As you can see, Brown's discoveries led to a new field of study called electroaerodynamics, which is still being explored today. Some engineers are able to replace various aircraft control surfaces, as well as slats and flaps on airplane wings, replacing them with electrodes on the wings. Take, for example, this research sponsored by Case Western Reserve University in 2020. Prince Gauche and Norbert Gratzel simply put strips of copper foil on a wing airfoil in a wind tunnel. And you can see here that they turn the wing to a high angle of attack, and you can see the smoke tracing out the airflow. The air has broken down into vortices on top of the wing. Anybody who knows anything about aircraft knows that is a stalled wing. That airplane is no longer flying. It's falling out of the sky. But now watch what happens when they simply apply a high voltage to the electrodes taped to the wing. The airflow becomes laminar. They haven't changed the airspeed at all, nor the wing's angle of attack, nor shape, and yet that aircraft would again be flying, all because they applied a high voltage to parts of the wings. Northrop, the company that designed and built the B-2 stealth bomber, as well as Grumman and Avco, had apparently been inspired by Brown's works to conduct research into electroaerodynamics for years before they revealed some of their results in a couple of articles in 1968. Laviolette summarized it nicely. They said they expected the resulting repulsive electric forces would condition the airstream so as to lower drag, reduce heating, and soften or eliminate the supersonic boom. The results showed that when high voltage DC is applied to a wing-shaped structure subjected to a supersonic flow, seemingly new electroaerodynamic qualities appear that result in significant air drag reduction on the structure and the virtual elimination of friction-caused aerodynamic heating, as well as the elimination of shockwave and wave drag phenomenon. You remember what former intelligence director John Ratcliffe said on Fox News about UFO capabilities? That they could travel at speeds that exceed the sound barrier without a sonic boom. Bingo! The US was developing that ability in the late 60s, 60 years ago. You remember what Louis Elizondo said about the UFOs in his interview with 60 Minutes a couple of weeks ago? And oh, by the way, the UAP has no obvious signs of propulsion, no wings, no control surfaces, and yet still can defy the natural effects of Earth's gravity. That's precisely what we're seeing. That is exactly what we saw in Brown's experiments. In fact, while he specified the craft could be any shape, i.e. the shape of a chiclet, or the shape of a tic-tac, his craft we're flying saucers, because of reasons. But, coming back to the virtual elimination of aerodynamic drag and heating, you remember, you remember Commander Fravor's description of the Tic Tac UFO? How it virtually disappeared right before his eyes? According to the radar reports, it was moving far faster than the Space Shuttle Columbia was when it sadly burned up from aerodynamic heating during re-entry. Based on what aerospace engineers were saying 60 years ago, electroaerodynamics held promise of flying at hypersonic speeds without aerodynamic heating. Now, I must say I don't like the term anti-gravity, as first of all, it's a misnomer. What Brown was claiming was to actually generate and control gravitational fields, as can be seen in his 1929 article in Science and Invention magazine. So let's say this effect we are witnessing is, in fact, generating a gravitational field. Let's take our lowly asymmetric capacitor and charge it up to a high voltage. This gravity field would presumably take a shape similar to the electromagnetic field. This field would, just like any electromagnetic field, envelop any objects within that field and not just the capacitor. 
So if it truly is a kind of gravitational field being developed, what would the effect be like? Let's take your car and put our asymmetrical capacitor in the back seat. Charging it up would be just like building a hill behind your car. The car would roll downhill. If you increase the voltage on the asymmetrical capacitor, then it generates a steeper hill and thus more gravitational pull. But you are generating the direction of the downhill, so it could be horizontal or even straight up. It's a crude analogy, but one that will hopefully help to envision what is potentially going on here. Because as the capacitor and everything enveloped inside the gravity field would start to slide in the direction of gravity, the capacitor moves and so does its generated gravity field. The car would move, of course, and so would you sitting in the car. So would the fuel in the tank, the air inside the car. Everything would move in unison because it is all being pulled by a common force, gravity. The acceleration on everything is the same. This is a critical point. Unlike sitting in a rocket where you light the rocket and the rocket engine pushes hard against the rocket, which in turn pushes hard against you, exerting what we call G-forces. These G-forces can not only injure you, they can kill you if they're strong enough because these are outside forces which push against your body, pushing against the muscle of your body and applying these forces to your bones, your internal organs, your blood. This is why pilots can black out from extreme G-forces as their body moves so fast that their blood can't keep up and all of the brain, all of the blood rushes out of their brain. In the situation of a gravity drive, however, this force field is pulling on the craft you are in, pulling on you, pulling on your bones, your internal organs, your blood, the fuel in the tank of the craft. All of it experiences the same acceleration in unison. There is effectively no strain on the craft or you or any part of your body. This would enable the craft and its occupants to move in ways that seem impossible feat to accomplish let alone survive. Let's come back to Louis Elizondo's comments. Imagine a technology that could do six to 700 G-forces that can fly at 13,000 miles an hour. That's precisely what we're seeing. When Commander Fravor was on Tucker Carlson's show describing the capabilities of this tic-tac-shaped craft he was observing, he candidly remarked, honestly, I wanted to fly it. <laughs> same, bro, same. <laughs> Look, I'm a geek. Why do you think I got into this whole anti-gravity research? You don't think I want to build a drone or an aircraft that would be able to fly supersonic without generating a sonic boom? Or accelerate at speeds that would normally induce hundreds of G-forces? I That would be so cool. Okay, okay. ADD is kicking in here. Let's get back to the topic at hand. Commander Fravor's comments he made in passing, describing his observations about the Tic Tac UFO hovering, held a significant clue. As it was hovering over the calm ocean, he described the water underneath the U UFO in a big circle as disturbed or white water. This is significant because it seemed there was some kind of field surrounding the UFO that was disturbing the water, and I sure wish I could have been the one to see it firsthand. What I'm trying to impress upon you here is the possibility that will slap anyone in the face who is a stoic defender of conventional physics. Now, this is radical stuff, but the question I'm trying to present here is, are these craft defying physics or our knowledge of physics? Are these craft supernatural, or are they simply a technology so sophisticated it appears as magic to us? I think you would agree that question is a pretty important one when trying to determine whether these UFOs are man-made super technology, extraterrestrial technology, or extranatural interdimensional technology. As many of you know, I'm a member of MENSA, the International High IQ Society. To be a member, you have to obtain an IQ score within the top 2% of the general population. Now, I want to be clear that having a genius level IQ only means you think really, really fast. So having genius level IQ just means you think stupid things faster than the average individual thinks it. You know, like thinking of a chiclet.
when you mean to think of a tic-tac. Yeah. You also realize you did something stupid far faster than the average individual realizes it, even though it still took me about three or four days to realize my stupid mistake. However, let's use Mensa's standard of genius level IQ for a second. China's genius level IQ population would number just under 29 million people. That's about the same as the population of the entire state of Texas. India's genius level population would number just under 28 million. The genius level IQ population of just those two countries combined is one and a half times the entire population of Canada. And even this small country of Canada that we call home has always held its own in terms of science and tech. The Canadian developed Avro era was decades ahead of its time, and that 1950s technology would rival our most advanced jet fighters today. The strange reaction of the government to not just cancel the Aero program, but systematically destroy all aircraft, plans, and documentations related to it, may have actually been the result of this up-and-coming anti-gravity technology. This was all in 1959, over 60 years ago. Bear in mind, the time between the Wright brothers' first powered aircraft flight and the landing on the moon was a mere 66 years. Think about how much technological advances might have been made since 1959. Now consider again the huge human resources of genius level IQ available to the Chinese government. A government not exactly known for being concerned about the safety of its people and environment. What could this population discover and develop? Already a notoriously secretive government, what have the Chinese already developed that's been kept a secret? And let us not forget Israel, which even though it is a tiny, tiny country, they have produced astonishing advancements in science and tech. They are also equally secretive, and most likely they are the ones who secretly test detonated a nuclear bomb of their own design back in 1979, detected by satellites and known as the Vela incident. Gordon Crichton became obsessed with UFOs in his late 40s and 50s and actually worked in Britain's intelligence community and eventually became the editor of Flying Saucer Review, one of the, if not the, most popular UFO magazines in the world. While originally Crichton was a strong believer that UFOs were extraterrestrial visitations, over the years his views changed. A pamphlet put up by the Flying Saucer Review in 1992 contained a statement of their official stance. There seems to be no evidence yet that any of these craft or beings originate from outer space. Now, Crichton and pretty much all other serious UFO researchers had plenty of reasons to say this. And here we are not quite 30 years later, and those reasons probably still stand. For example, while UFOs have given off radar signatures, there has never been a radar track showing the actual entering of UFOs into our atmosphere. Take the 2014 Tic Tac event I have referenced heavily so far. While the UFO showed up on radar at 80,000 feet and descended with astonishing speed, it was still very much always seen in our atmosphere. UFOs have pestered multiple nations, some of whom have fired upon these things. Yes, even Canadian pilots, hey, don't mess with them bush pilots flying the beavers. Those guys always got guns. But no one has managed to shoot one down. The UFOs, that is. The UFOs sometimes change shape. This is very odd. In part one, we discussed the staggering numbers of encounters annually all over the world. Even if there were millions of advanced civilizations around our galaxy, the odds of being visited by one of them every year are ridiculously slim. Yet, you saw the numbers yourself. We have hundreds of visitations per month. The alleged aliens associated with UFOs all seem to have perfect compatibility with Earth's atmosphere. None of them appear to need any breathing apparatus, for example. As we'll discuss next week, UFO encounters that have aliens associated with them are almost always are what can be described as a supernatural event. 
For example, the aerial school encounter in Zimbabwe, where dozens of school children came within arm's length of these beings and their craft at the edge of the field. The children described things like time standing still, all sounds stopping, and the beings communicated by telepathy. Usually such aliens have what can only be described as demonic powers, and they almost always involve the occult. Does it seem odd to you that E.T. would fly all the way across the galaxy just to come tell us to, we should get involved in the occult? I mean, I find that odd, but hey, maybe it's just me. And lastly, I will leave you today with a final point so eloquently brought to the forefront by Gary Bates in his excellent book, Alien Intrusion. Unknown lights, objects, and shapes have been observed in the skies for thousands of years. Reports have been handed down through the ages from many nations of the world, including India, China, Japan, England, Ireland, France, Italy, the Americas, Scandinavian countries, and Polynesia. Ancient Romans and Greeks had stories of fiery globes and flying shields. Ancient Egyptians left accounts of circles of fire and flaming chariots that sailed across the heavens. American Indians have legends of flying canoes and great silvery airships. Some of these early vehicles were also said to contain occupants. I've tried to emphasize the history that we can document leading into technologies that apparently went black and classified top secret. From there, we can only speculate. But even with all of that, and as astonishing as it may be that some of this technology is a century old, obviously the reports Bates brings up would be well before the time of this high tech. Notice I didn't bring up any technological mysteries that still baffle us to this day, like the construction of the pyramids of Giza. I would contend that rather than aliens and their technology coming to earth to help humans build the pyramids, it was just really, really smart people. But these historic UFO incidents, I do not think are human creations. We'll see the reasons why in part three of these series. I hope you'll join me again. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K 2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support.